right now and others who may be joining us from all over the world. We're glad you have joined us. Beginning a brand new series, I mentioned it last week, of, uh, we're titling it uh, the uh, Enough of the Negative, uh, because I tell you, I have just been bombarded with it, as all of you have, and I try to work hard not letting my circumstances or my environment affect me, but I guess just now with, you know, three, four months of, uh, well, uh, you know, to begin with, the, the COVID-19 statistics, you know, the how many te- positive test results, how many hospitalizations, how many vents are being used, how many deaths are being used, how many reoccurrences, reinfections are taking place. You know, we've been hearing about this now for months, and then on top of that, we have our concerns with the economy, you know, what's taking place not only in our local economy, but in the state and in the country and really around the world. And if you pay attention to this stuff, it's a little scary, and, you know, no one seems to have any real answers in my experience. Uh, You know, the talks that we have about, uh, you know, loss of livelihood and businesses, the stock market turned down, uh, the future economy of the United States... It just never ends, you know? And then additionally, we have more recently the, you know, the racial tension stuff that, is, that has been taking place and, you know, uh, uh, the division that takes place over that, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter things and the protests, uh, discussions lately about, hey, I know the answer. Let's just get rid of the police departments, you know? And I'm like, what? Uh, but, you know, I mean, just bombardment. And even before all of this stuff, I have to, just a little confession, I have to admit that I I had years ago repented of watching too much news because I tended to get worked up and it made me negative. But uh, since Trump got elected, I have to admit, I I just found such recreational pleasure in listening to Trump speak and the the recreational piece is is the ruffling of the feathers of the politically correct. I have to admit, I just totally enjoy that, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, people say, uh, you know, he shouldn't be so crass and he shouldn't be so harsh and all that kind of thing. And, you know, I understand where they're coming from and part of me agrees with that. But on the other hand, it really adds to the ruffling of the politically correct group. So I just, you know, I've just been uh, caught up in the news and I've realized that even before COVID-19 hit, uh, you know, Trump especially has just divided, uh, you know, his way has divided this country. Uh, I mean, there's always some, you know, uh, discontent on either side of the aisle. But uh, now, I mean, it's gone from disagreement over the issues to what appears to be just full-on hatred, you know, just uh, full-on despising and uh, demeaning of people. And that's been going on since easily 2016, uh, this division between progressives and conservatives. And, and it seems like most people have been caught up in all of this, or even in social media. Again, much like we see in uh, our Congress, where it's become quite personal. I mean, I talk to people all the time who have unfriended legitimate real friends because of, you know, political views and that sort of thing. And it's just, it's just negative. It can leave you kind of fearful, can leave you angry, it can leave you uh, defeated, really sort of numb and indifferent. And I've realized I've been kind of experiencing some of this. Uh, you know, I've, I've had a, the sensitivity, you know, Colleen and I have been kind of going back because it feels to me like, you know, too often when she speaks to me, there's like this harsh tone that takes place. I'm like, hey, hey, hey. You know, I'm a reasonable man. All you got to do is talk to me. She says, that is all I'm doing is talking to you. I'm like, no, no, you got that snappiness going on. You know, you got that harsh thing going on. You married people, you know what I'm talking about there? And she's convinced it's my ears, and I'm convinced it's her mouth. <laughs> and that's, you know, just the influence of this negativity. But I tell you what was the clincher. The clincher was not long ago. I mean, within the last couple of weeks where I realized, okay, I'm being infected with negativity here. Colleen and I were going to Costco. Uh, how many Costco members are, are here? So if, if you're a member, you know how it works. You know, you come down Palendale and you turn into the parking lot towards uh, Costco. And, and before you get to the Costco store, you, you reach the Costco gas station, right? And we were going to stop and get gas. So I, you know, I pull in and I'm waiting for that left-hand turn to get my gasoline. And, uh, you know, as always, there's several cars that are, you know, coming the opposite direction. So I'm waiting before I make my left-hand turn into the pumps. And there's one car behind me also, I notice. And as soon as the last car coming towards me passes, 
I begin to initiate my left-hand turn, as does the person who was behind me. And I'm not kidding. They rear around me, go all the way around me, and zoom up to the one, the one pump that was actually open. I mean, just came out from behind me, sped up, and comes charging into that pump. Now, I'm not a man given to rage of, of my 1,001 defects of character. That's not really one of them. At least, at least I have one good character defect that keeps me from outwardly raging, because one of my defects of character is it's really important to me what you, people think of me, which is why I would never rage publicly, because you would think I'm an idiot. But I can rage internally, and I'm telling you, when this person pulled out in front of me, I'm like, first I was shocked, and then shock quickly gave way to anger. Now, normally, on something that minor, I'm telling you, normally, that would be something where I'd have one simple thought, you're an idiot, and then I would be moving on and not giving a second thought about it. But this time, I become the idiot because I'm like, oh, oh, no, 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 you know, on the inside. And so I pull up behind her, I said, you're going to see my homicidal face. <laughs> I mean, I had hand gestures going on in my head. But not outwardly, because again, it matters what people think of me. So, and, in, and, 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 and next to that pump was another pump that opened. You would think I'd just move on and go fuel up. No, I'm going to stay behind this woman, and she's going to see my angry face. And I think maybe it was working because it took her forever to get out of the car. Like maybe she was conflicted about what she did. And even after that, you know, I finally said, okay, Barry, settle down, you know. And so I, I, I went over and, uh, you know, pulled out, backed up, and went to the empty pump. But even when I'm gassing up my car, I'm looking at her, you know, just trying to make eye contact. So again, I don't know, you know, some kind of Jedi thing. Maybe I can kill her in my heart or something, you know. <clears throat> And it didn't end there. I mean, even in the Costco store, I'm looking for her because I want to look at her with an angry scowl. And by this time, I'm sure she's not even thinking about it. And I realized, okay, Barry, you have got a problem here. Calm down. And so in this series, I want to take a look at just you know, the whole subject of negativity and the influence it can have on our life and things that we can do about it. One thing I'm quite sure of is that the Bible makes a very clear case that as Christ followers, really, we have no place for negativity in our life. As Christ followers, we should really view life with, a, with an attitude of it being hope-filled. We should have an attitude of assurance, of even joy. We should be optimistic about life because of all that Christ has done for us. Now, in the Webster Dictionary of Optimism, it's defined like this. It's confidence about a successful outcome in the future. Confidence believing that something good's coming. It's an assurance, a belief that there's going to be a positive or successful kind of outcome. But if I were to add some, you know, some biblical weight to that definition and bring that into a more biblically appropriate definition, the way I would define from a Christian viewpoint is optimism is the unwavering expectation that our loving God is working every situation for our future good. Every situation for our future good. It's this unwavering expectation, a deep assurance down deep in our souls. Now let me tell you what this optimism is not. It is not a picture of being in denial or minimizing the hard realities of a broken world. I think as Christ followers, more than anybody, we should be looking at reality squarely in the face. I mean, Christians, uh, this denial and minimization, I've heard it for decades, you know, that somehow because we're Christ followers, we should have no problems or struggles. And if you do have problems and struggles and feelings, something's wrong with your faith. Or, you know, no denial, minimization stuff. Uh, you know, I've seen this attitude of, hey, don't sweat the small stuff, and then they always tack on to it. And by the way, everything is the small stuff. Or, listen, the Christian life is carefree. It's all about love and joy and blessing. Now, I say a lot of people get derailed in the faith because that's the package that got sold to them, and then guess what? It didn't deliver. And while there's much truth in that statement that the Christian life is characterized by blessing, by love, by joy. It's also characterized, this side of eternity, by lots of tears, by lots of heartache, by lots of sorrow. Amen? That is the reality that we look at. Optimism is not magical thinking. 
I mean, examples of magical thinking are the idea that, hey, as a Christ follower, you can go through the tough stuff, but it doesn't really feel like tough stuff. You know, it really shouldn't hurt. I'm like, what? But that's a common idea that's out there, magical thinking. How about you could just reverse any negative thing that's going on in your life. You can reverse it and make it into something that's not a negative just by employing the name of Jesus, and it all goes away. Or another example of magical thinking is that, hey, because Christ suffered on your behalf, you don't have to suffer anymore. I tried to count how many pages of my Bible I'd have to rip out to stand by that statement, that I don't have to, st- to, cr- to suffer anymore because Christ suffered for me. Christian optimism is this unwavering confidence in God's goodness and being extremely realistic about the day-to-day realities of life. And so for a starting point in this series, um, uh, I, I, I want you to understand that all the resources we need are given by the Holy Spirit to be optimistic in very troubling times, and the very foundation of where all of these resources begin, where all of heaven's treasures begin, so that we can maintain a healthy, reality-based optimism in the Christian faith, it all begins with this idea that in Christ you have been reconciled to God. Reconciliation, now that's a $10 word that really is the foundation. It is the source of all of our hope, all of our confidence, all of our security, all of our peace, all of our purpose. Now let me begin with the definition of reconciliation. It's a theological term that goes like this. The process by which a holy God and sinful man are brought together again, replacing hostility with favor. And it's probably best talked about in Paul's letter to the Corinthians where he wrote, God was in Christ making peace between the world and himself. In Christ, God did not hold the world guilty of its sins. And so Jesus' death, it was the penalty for my sin. It was the penalty paid for your sin. Jesus took our guilt so that we could be declared not guilty. And inviting Jesus into our heart and making him Lord and Savior of our life removes all guilt, all wrong, all grief and heartache that others have caused, that we have caused, past, present, and future. It really is the ultimate foundation of optimism, this being reconciled. And when we look at reconciliation, I see, there's probably more, but I just want to give you three areas of reasons where we can be optimistic because of the reconciliation that Christ appropriated for us on his cross that he took the penalty for our sin. So to begin with, first benefit of reconciliation is that we can have peace with God. Romans 5.10 says, even when we were God's enemies, he made peace with us because his son died for us. Yet something even greater than friendship is ours now that we are at peace with God. and We will be saved by his son's life. And so reconciliation, I mean, it's a starting point of the gospel. The entire Christian life is actually lived out by the power of the gospel, but this is the starting point of the gospel. God loved us while we were sinners. He loves us now. This love was demonstrated when Christ died for us. And it creates what Paul said, friendship with God. But then he also goes, but you know what's even better than friendship with God? What's even better than friendship with God is that we are now reconciled or having peace with God, being at peace with him. How many of you know what it's like, the tension when there's not peace between people, I mean, you married people, you, you know about this, you know, there's friction there, the things aren't quite right, there's just this absence of peace that takes place between, relation, between us in relationships, you know. Uh, we know people who can be controlling, we know people who can be uptight, people who can be selfish, They can be manipulative. They can be untrustworthy. And when you're around people like this, how many of you know that it's hard to relax, right? It's hard to be yourself. It's, it's, uh, you know, you don't feel like you can let your guard down. And that's how it goes when relationship and trust have been broken and now there is this hostility that exists between us. 
Reconciliation ends the hostility. Having peace with God means that you can relax. Having peace with God means that you can be yourself, that you can let your guard down, that you can now enjoy complete, unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. Peace with God means God changes that hostility vibe that was once there, and he replaces it with peace. And so now he calls you friend. He communicates that he's for you, that he's with you, that he'll protect you, he'll provide for you, he'll be with you in the storm, or as we were just singing about, he'll be with you in the fire. And when your tough days on earth are finished, you'll be securely with him forever. Peace with God's a good thing, amen? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. God visited our broken world through Christ coming to the earth. His mission was to break and conquer the power of sin and death, both in the world at large, but really more importantly, in your life individually. And so when God does this for you individually, how many of you know that a a, a response of some kind is appropriate. When the, the most magnificent gift that could ever be given is given to you, a response is expected. God's looking for a response. After demonstrating such love, he's looking for a response from us. And I would offer that the response that probably is most important is this, that we are surrendering to him. Maybe to be more specific, I would say total unconditional surrender, admitting that God is God and you are not. It's amazing to me how many people have a problem with that idea, that God is God and you are not. I've had people argue that with me. It's like, what? (laughs) Fascinating to me. Surrender, total unconditional surrender, means giving up the ridiculous notion that you know what's better for your life than the God who loves you and created you. That you would know better than the God who knows you and loves you, your creator. It means giving up your rebellious attitude. That you don't get to pick and choose which of God's ways you like and which of God's ways you get to ignore. Surrender just doesn't leave that option on the table. It's total, it's complete surrender, and it's renewable day by day, hour by hour, because our propensity is to live life not surrendered. And so it has to be renewed, re-upped all the time. You make a commitment to engage in relationship with Christ and to stay surrendered to God so that he can transform you from the inside out, so that he can make you a better person than you currently are today. Why should you surrender to God's will this way? Well, how about just that that's what God created you for? How about a good reason for surrendering is because that's the way life was always meant to be lived. You were never meant to live a life as God's creation that was separate from him. Never meant to live a life that was anything less than surrendered to him. You were created to walk with him moment by moment, day by day, in loving relationship, surrender to his plan, his purposes, his ways. It is the natural thing to do. This surrender, it's really an adjective that describes our relationship with the God who loves us and the God who rescues us. He didn't provide reconciliation so that you could return to the problem, which is self-will, independence, and being separated from him. Peace with God, it's a picture of a life surrendered to God. And now that the separation problem has become resolved, you take advantage of that. You walk in the freedom. And really, the surrendered life is the greatest picture of human freedom that we could possibly have. Hard to be negative and pessimistic when you're splashing around in the freedom of God's love. Just hard to be pessimistic when you got that going on. So reconciliation provides peace with God. A second reason to be optimistic is that it provides the peace of God, which is really a, a, uh, an emotional peace that's being referred to here. Um, 
I'm wondering if you've ever analyzed what actually robs you of your peace. I mean, I'm assuming you're like me. You have your moments where on the inside it's not so peaceful. Have you ever stopped to think about what it is? I have, and I've looked at it in the mirror, and I've looked at it in uh, the, the lives of people who I've chatted with over the years, and I, I kind of think it falls into three basic categories of how our peace gets stolen from us. First of all are these uncontrollable circumstances. These would be things like illnesses, deaths, layoffs, and worldwide pandemics. <laughs> A second category is unchangeable people. These are the people who simply don't cooperate with your agenda to change them. And that's what robs you of your peace is that they won't let you play God in their life, you know? And the third area I see are just unexplainable problems, and those would just be any and all problems that come under the broad category of unfair. And when these three things are taking place, good chances are your peace has been stolen from you. And then I've observed that we can respond in one of three ways. We can either rise up and determine to get control of the situation and circumstance, or a person with, with twice the fervor. We can just work at it harder. Or the second possibility of what we can do when these things are happening is that we can just throw up our hands up and give up and quit trying altogether and you know, really just become sort of a victim to these kind of experiences and, and uh, you know, uh, live this life that's you know, um, pessimistic. You know, it's inevitable you would become pessimistic if you, if you just, you know, become a victim of these type of things. So, you know, you can double down on trying to change it all, or you can give up and become pessimistic. Or the third thing is, is that you might want to try, you know, depending on the Holy Spirit and responding to things the way Jesus would respond. That's a third option. Obviously, that would be the one that I would recommend for us. Paul gives us some powerful tools on how to enjoy this peace of God, and my favorite of all of them is found in Philippians. It says, don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude, telling Him every detail of your life. And boy, I tell you, man, right there, there's just a whole bunch of tools in those two verses. I mean, the whole thing of don't be pulled in different directions, a lot of your translations will say, be anxious for nothing. The best biblical definition of anxiety is being pulled off of the direction that God intends for you and being into whatever other direction you might have going on. Really, another way of saying this is that if we always stayed on the right track, on the right path, we wouldn't have anxiety. So whenever I feel this anxious stuff rising up inside of me, I'm wondering, hmm, where did I turn left and I should have turned right? because it's always associated with being on the wrong path, the wrong direction. So part of how we have the peace of God, how we can take uh, advantage of this peace that's given us, is make sure that we're heading in the right direction. It says also, be saturated in prayer throughout each day. This is that saturated in prayer word is the same word that's used when Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica where he said, you know, to pray without ceasing. It's this idea of, hey, you're just talking with the Lord conversationally through all things big and small, all of these experiences that we go through. I think about how that Costco experience I was talking about, you should know I talk to the Lord at length about that experience because I've trained myself that when I see ugliness in me, I want to see myself get cleaned up, cleared up, and resolved of that stuff in me. And so, you know, I had lots of R-rated talk with the Lord about the ugly stuff that was going on inside of me. That's what he's talking about here, of just being saturated with prayer throughout each day. That's a tool. You know, don't look at your prayer life as just the stuff you do in the morning and then forget about God the rest of the day. I'm always looking for us to bring up the moments of with God moments as we go through the course of our day. And it gives us other idea here of offering faith-filled, re- ah, back. Uh, faith-filled requests before God. You know, in other words, it's okay to tell God what's on your heart and what you would like, but the before God piece of that is a lot of times we don't take the time to actually get into God's presence. We're still on the wrong path in the presence of anxiety. It's really hard to make your requests known to God when you're not even in God's presence yet, you know? This whole thing of before God would be an alternative to, you know, before 
your anxiety or before your worry. Trying to talk to God, but what's really in my face is the worry, is the anxiety type of stuff. So I said, hey, clear all that out, get in touch with God, and then talk to him about what's on your heart, your request there. Another example he gives, stay, stay here, uh, Kristen. Um, <clears throat> Um, faithful request before God with overflowing gratitude. Our prayer life and staying uh, in the peace of God, it's a huge tool because it's true that in a broken, fallen world, we've got lots of trouble, we've got lots of problems, but the reality is, is that uh, um, we have much to be grateful for. And so my encouragement is, you know, maybe you could even start off with, you know, hey, Lord, before I talk about the, the thing in my life that's troubling me and concerning me, let me tell you about 10 things that I'm super grateful for. I mean, that alone can really help bring the anxiety level down. Tell them about every detail of your life. And again, Costco example comes to mind there where I was talking to him about the details of my life. And you know, what was going on in all of that. And so we do well to talk to him about those kind of matters. And when we do that now, Kristen, verse 7, then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus. And actually, by the time you've done most of those steps, having the answer isn't even that important because you've actually now just found Jesus. <laughs> and entered into that sense of his love and care for you, and it doesn't really even matter what the answer is. Third benefit of, of reconciliation and reason to be optimistic is that we have peace with others. Once you've experienced this peace with God and you've begun to learn how to enjoy the peace of God, God wants you to now begin to have some joy and peace with those that you're in relationship with. It's what Scripture refers to as becoming an ambassador of reconciliation. We help others to be reconciled to God by pointing them to Christ, and we actually go about being reconciled with other people. Paul put it this way in his letter to the Corinthians. He said, all this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to what? to settle our relationships with each other. Don't you hate that part of Scripture? <laughs> Anytime you attempt to restore a broken relationship, you're doing what Jesus would do. I mean, attempts to be reconciled, whether in our own relationships or helping others reconcile their relationships, the Bible calls you now being a minister of reconciliation. Now, what does it mean to settle our relationships with each other? We don't settle our relationships. Again, there's this nonsense out there in the Christian community that as Christ followers, everything's supposed to be nice, nice, and sugary sweet, and all that kind of stuff. And really, and so in order to pull that off, we try to settle relationships by avoiding the conflict altogether or delaying dealing with the conflict. And when we finally do step up to the conflict, we so sugarcoat it that we haven't really been honest at all. And guess what? Nothing ever really gets resolved with that. Or maybe we just start to appease and, and give in to the other's unreasonable type of uh, expectations. We just go passive. And again, not a lasting solution. I think actually this whole idea of being settling our relationships with each other is actively seeking to end the conflict, extending grace as grace was extended to you in Christ Jesus. It's forgiving, it's burying the hatchet, burying the hatchet, but not burying the problem. Because problems that get buried have a nasty, nasty way of reoccurring, right? But we can bury the hatchet it's a decision, really. It's a decision. It's a choice that I put this way. I don't choose the hostility between us any longer. I'm just not going to participate in the hostility. And resolving those kind of things, I mean, gosh, at the most extreme cases, 
you know, to, to be reconciled to somebody is really just to kind of keep your distance from them. I mean, if you happen to be in a relationship with somebody who is a card-carrying narcissist, you know, narcissistic people, they always have this attitude that says, I've got a little something special going on in my world and in my life. My insights are a little special, which is why you should really just pay attention to everything I say and do as I say. And they can never be wrong, and they're, they're simply unreasonable. And when you cross these lines with them, I mean, they will control and manipulate and go to virtually any length to get manipulatively what they want from you. And if you actually set a boundary with them, th- then uh, they will, you know, they'll, they'll become this pathetic, whiny dog be- with his tail between his legs. I'm so sorry, I won't we'll do it again. Ah! And so you let your guard down, and then they go back and do it all over again. Now, that's with somebody that's narcissistic. But even that person, we can actually, you know, settle this. Well, that's actually a whole sermon series in itself of how to communicate with a narcissist. Would you guys like to hear that sermon sometime, though? Because <laughs> chances are you're actually in a relationship with somebody who is one. So, <laughs> No, no. Okay. I uh, have become distracted. Okay, so here's why we are reluctant to do this, to choose, uh, you know, to end the hostility, is because there is this confusion between, you know, uh, trust and forgiving people, this confusion between reconciliation and resolution, but they are immensely different. I mean, the whole reconciliation thing, when you are a minister of reconciliation and you're going to choose to no longer have the hostility, you really don't need to have the other person's participation whatsoever. That's just something you can do on your own accord. But if we want to actually have resolution, that will require the other person's participation because that other person is hurtful. That other person is manipulative and controlling. That other person, if we, if we don't set boundaries and limits with them, we're going to do damage to our lives. And so we keep our distance until they actually show some fruits of repentance. And then we, have, we very much have an obligation to try to work towards resolution. But reconciliation, that is just ending the hostility, we have a choice about that. And you do well to exercise that choice because if you don't, man, you're living a life that's filled with re- bitterness and resentment and anger and grudges, which really makes optimism a psychological impossibility. Some of the most negative, pessimistic people I have ever met, when you start exploring their life and their life experiences, you find out they're filled with resentment, bitterness, anger, grudges. Again, I think virtually impossible to be optimistic when you live your life this way. So that brings me to my application. Number one, if you haven't done so yet, be reconciled to God. And I'm looking here and I'm thinking most everybody in this room has made the decision to invite Christ into their life, but I don't know who's watching online. And to to you, I would say, listen, God moved all in in his love for you. To you, I would say that he demonstrated an all-in move of love for you And he has provided reconciliation. And like I talked about earlier, you would do well to simply surrender to this God who loves you. It's what you were created for. Admit to him that you're broken and hurting. Ask his forgiveness. Invite him into your heart. Make a place for him at the center of your heart. Come here to living hope. Be solidly involved in Christian community and grow as a Christ follower. Secondly, I would offer that we need to think about or to think like a reconciled Christ follower. And where I'm going with that is the idea that the hostility has been has ended, and yet I know that there are people who tend to struggle with condemnation and guilt still. They have serious doubts about whether God is for you or not. The past is still sort of haunting you. And when that's been sort of going on and you've been a Christ follower for quite a long while and yet guilt and condemnation 
are existing, that's not usually because of a belief problem. It's usually a result of an injury problem, certain wounds and hurts that need special attention. And so I invite you, get the help you need. If you've walked with Christ for, you know, more than a year or two, and yet I'm always, you know, right, never too far away from that guilt and condemnation stuff, you probably need some healing work in your life. It's not a question of believing. It's really a question of injury that needs God's antibiotics. Number three, I want you to spend some time with this passage in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. I mean, you know, anxiety is about being on the right direction and having gotten off on a wrong direction, being saturated in prayer, faith-filled requests before God, and maintaining gratitude, telling Him the details of your life. I mean, this would be a good passage for you to memorize, to meditate on. Let it be a prayer guide in your life, you know? Uh, prayer guide meaning just I can take these tools that are mentioned in these simple verses and, and use them as help in how I talk to God. Spend some time. This is a fabulous verse that we should all be quite familiar with. And then the final application point I'd leave you with is who do you need to make peace with? That's one of the benefits of this thing called reconciliation is that we can be at peace with with others. And as I bring that up, again, I'm not suggesting that you need to be actively involved in relationship, but I am suggesting that if there's still resentment, if there's still anger, if there's still, you know, if you do in your mind what I was doing with that woman at Costco <laughs> towards somebody, that's somebody you need to deal with because it robs you of the optimism that we should walk in and it'll leave you quite pessimistic. So, Father, I thank you that even though in this broken world with so much reason to be pessimistic, that in Jesus, Father, we are able to say it is well with my soul, that we could rejoice in all things, that we can know without any hesitation and with great assurance that life is worth living and that it's a blessing that we need not be swept away in, the, in the, the negativity of the world that we're in. Help us to be ministers of reconciliation. Help us to embrace our own reconciliation. Thanks for hearing our prayers. And everyone said, amen. amen.